ones that need it the most. But you can get so sick till you don't have an appetite. You can get so cold, and just before freezing to death, you feel warm. And that's what we are facing in this hour, is that dangerous, deceiving spirit that makes us feel like we're all right. If you get to feeling that way, just remember the very fact you feel that way means there's something seriously wrong with you. That's the truth. If you feel content and that you don't need any more and that you're all right just like you are, that's sign enough that you need some help. I truly tonight feel from the bottom of my heart a desperate need of more of God. Since I have been here, I have prayed in this church desperately for more of God. I could not say of a truth that I feel satisfied. I cannot. And tell the truth. I don't mean by that that I don't feel that if the Lord should come, I would be ready. I feel like I would. But I do feel this, that I wouldn't be ready if I was satisfied with what I've got. I've got to go deep. And I have made up my mind, and have it already, extended fast, longer than I've ever gone in my life, and get along with God until I can get more of Him. I can't stand this. To face what we've got to face from here, the last lap, you better make up your mind that you're going to kill the flesh and get willing to humble yourself and obey the Lord. Hallelujah. This is the most dangerous time I've ever known or seen or heard of. And I don't believe that I'm all that uh, far off. I really don't believe I am. I uh, I just never seen spirits move among people like they move anymore. I never seen such a dangerous time to fall asleep. You see what happens. I'm just talking to you now, and maybe we'll get to preaching later. But what happens if you uh, was to happen to go visit someone or maybe move? Uh, if there are strange noises around you, let's say you just uh, went to uh, on a trip and you happen to stop at a place, a night or two or three, and there's a big engine running outside the building. You've not been used to that. The noise of that is going to bother you. You're not used to it. It'll keep you awake a lot of times. It'll bother you. Uh, some people are extra sound sleepers, but uh, even at that, sometimes the new noises, different noises, will disturb them. But you stay there a while. First thing you know, you can go to sleep and never pay that thing any attention. And what really happens is it actually, after you've gotten used to this noise, it would take far more noise to wake you than it would have before you got used to this loud sound. Now what I'm saying is this. Do you know what scares me about churches where uh, God moves and where there is a pastor who sounds an alarm loud and hard and, and he calls in preachers to jar you? Churches like that, if they go to sleep under the sound of this preaching, are harder to wake up than those that haven't heard it. You're in more danger tonight in some respects than people who have not had this ministry. Because what happens, it takes more and more and louder and louder noises to keep you awake. 
to keep you stirred. Oh, God. First thing you know, a man can reach his limit. Actually, it's the truth. And I have seen churches, good churches, that fell into that dangerous pitfall. That pastor is careful. I'm thinking of a church right now that uh, has had some of the very best ministry. And uh, the pastor is careful to never pick anybody but what he feels like could really stir his people. Well, that's good. But on the other hand, if that church or individuals in that church decides they're going to go to sleep under all of this, what then will it take to wake them up? And really, I'm afraid that's somewhat your problem. You have heard loud, thundering voices of God. And sometimes under that, you fall asleep. Get used to it. Accustomed to it. Go to sleep. Please don't do it now, because we're about to get out of here. Glory to God. Won't be long now, folks. Praise God. Wake up. Wake up. Won't be long now. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I can remember as a boy, we had to walk to church quite a ways. And after church, having slept on that old slat bench, and uh, see, these kids have got so much better place to sleep than I had slept. Leg had fall in the crack there, and so uncomfortable, but still go to sleep on it. After church, time to get up and go home now and have to walk that sleepy. And just a staggering down that road about half asleep. So tired. Oh, so tired. But what a welcome sight it was to me. I mean, I was tired. Mile and a half, two miles. Climbing a hill. What a welcome sight when I could see that old uh, kerosene lamp in the window up on that hill in that little old unpainted house. Oh, what a welcome sight. And be home in a little bit. Kind of helped me to wake up a little bit because it's just a little ways. I feel tonight that I've got just a little ways. I see the light. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank God, if that's the lights of home, I see. I want you to know it's a welcome sight. Praise God. And I believe it is. We're not far from it. And I beg you as desperately as I've ever pled, don't, don't go to sleep now. Amen. Don't Amen. get entangled with earthly things and get tied up. Don't do it. Don't uh, take the warning of Jesus who said that there was somebody went forth and he put some seed out and some of it was choked. Choked. Actually, in Laurel, Mississippi tonight, not just here in the church tonight, but in connection with this church, there are people hanging by a noose now around their neck. They're choked. They're gagging. They're just about to breathe their last breath. Choked. You know what's got them choked? Exactly, exactly what Jesus Christ said would choke them. What was it? He described what choked that seed. He said, these thorns that choked it were, namely, cares of this life. Everybody say it. Say it again. One more time. You know what that is? That's not sinful things. That's things you actually can do and it not necessarily be a sin. It's things you even need to do. But there's so many of them until they have subtracted you away from God. Drawn. Your affections are drawn. 
to care. Cares of this life, deceitfulness of riches, say it with me, deceitfulness of riches, say it one more time, deceitfulness of riches, and what else? Lust of other things. Now that that didn't say adultery. That didn't say fornication. No. See the thing that's so dangerous, church, is some folks get the idea that you'd have to commit some real bad sin for you to ever be lost. As long as you live fairly clean, you're going to make it. Well, that's Baptist doctrine. Right. Amen. There was Baptist doctrine in the world. That's what they always say. Right. Do you believe Amen. what they always say? No. How could we? Oh, God. But you can sit around. And when I say sit around... I don't mean that you're lazy. You're up. You're going. You're working. You're doing things. But it's cares of this life. It's deceitfulness of riches. It's not that you're rich. Paul said they that would be rich. He didn't say they that were rich. He said they that would be rich fall into hurtful lust and the temptations, which are drowned in these things, into perdition and destruction. They that would be rich just got occupied trying to be rich, trying to reach a little money. Deceitfulness of riches. Well, there's people that'll die and go to hell in Long, Mississippi over one thing, and that's 10% of their salary. The deceitfulness of riches. They get to looking at what I pay 10%. And honestly, you watch it. The, a lot of times, the bigger the tent, the less they want to pay it. They never consider that <laughs> they're also getting more too. And lust of other things, just wanting things, just want. And uh, some of it, just uh, not all that bad, but it's just lust of other things. Things you don't really need, things you shouldn't have. Bitching for it. Choked. Choked. Strangled. Can't pray. I don't know why I can't pray. Choked. Cares of life's got you hanging right now. Big old loose around your neck. Just just tight. Oh, and it's getting tighter. Right? Choked. The devil's pulling on. Come on, you're too busy to go to church tonight. Come on, you're too busy to pray today. Come on, you've got too much to do. Cares of life. Running you to death. Run you to death. When have you stopped to love him? When have you stopped to praise him? When have you stopped to soak your soul in his presence? When have you stopped long enough to absorb some of God? How long has it been since you just sat down in his presence and let the whole mess go? Never fall through. I'm going to touch God today. I don't care what happens. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Hallelujah. Let's get the noose from around our neck tonight. Hallelujah. Good people. Sincere people. People that wouldn't teach out of anything. People that wouldn't lie. People that wouldn't commit adultery. People that wouldn't rebel against their pastor under normal conditions. But you see what happens? When you get so far along choked, your strength leaves you, and God only knows what spirit will enter you. Oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm still stirred tonight, sir. Hallelujah. You know the spirit of that service never did lift all day long here today. I felt it all day. Still feel it tonight. Say, Brother Bean, let's uh, shout a little bit. Let's have something more uplifting. Not right now. 
And I was after somebody. He's trying to save somebody. Amen. Are you willing for God to just work on us again tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Who wants to be worked on tonight again by the Holy Ghost? Oh, you really do? Hallelujah. You want God to save you? Hallelujah. Want God to jar you a little bit more? Let's ask Him to touch us. Open your heart. Let's pray. My God. My God. In the name of Jesus. My Father and my God, I beg you as desperately as I've ever prayed in my life. Oh God, pour out the Spirit in this place. Manifest yourself unto this people. Pour out the Holy Ghost like rain on the mown grass. Shake your people. Move them closer to you. I caught the fear and tremble at your word. Name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm hungry to hear from God tonight. Really feel the stir of the Holy Ghost. He's the Lord. I am. Uh, been uh, taking a little time out to listen to some of the tape recordings of some of the preachers you have heard here. I thought today, dear God, what a preacher that fellow Extet is. No wonder they wanted to record his messages. Mine's so scatter barrel, I don't know who would want to record them. I don't know if you'll understand them later or not. But I've got to obey the Lord. I haven't come here to teach no Bible lessons on who Melchizedek is, and I don't say that's not important. I love to hear it. I'm glad I heard that. I learned some things. Really appreciate that. But right now, you know what we need? We need a good Holy Ghost shaking in law. Amen. We need to get down to points that, that reach where you live right now. Right. Amen. There's a time for all things. Right. Amen. You need this other kind of meat. You need this other kind of food at times. But there comes a time you've got to have this. Hallelujah. And right. so here we are with this. God knows I wouldn't change it tonight for nobody. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. In the book of Second Chronicles, I'm going to preach not less than five sermons tonight because I'm limited in time in law. I've got to leave here tomorrow night. And every one of these need to be preached in this place. So uh, get ready. Amen. I'm going to try to condense them to where they want each. Each one of them is an hour and a half apiece. But I'm going to do my best to condense them. To where we won't have to sit there all that time. And uh, so don't get scared nor alarmed. I don't promise you I'll have you out by nine. It, but uh, I told you when I started here several years ago, I always dismissed my audience at 9.30. I may be preaching at 10, but you're dismissed at 9.30, and I won't feel bad if every one of you leave. Brother Lawrence will be here, and I'll finish my message on him. And on this tape recorder that Brother Beach is going to leave on as he goes out. So, uh, <laughs> if you want to leave Brother Beach, just tell me which button to push to cut I'll that thing out. All right. He said he'll stay with me. Amen. In the book of Second Chronicles, the 18th chapter, and to begin reading at 23rd verse, Then Zedekiah, the son of Shenanah, came near and smote Micaiah upon the cheek, and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day, and thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. Now, this story is, uh, of course, develops around the fact that a king wanted to go into a battle, and I don't think I have to tell you too much about it. You remember it. And uh, Ahab was so desirous to go into this battle that he began to inquire of his favorite prophets, and they all said go. But Jehoshaphat was included in it. He didn't feel right about it. He said, is there one more prophet? And yes, there is, but, and I thought of this prophet tonight, 
because it sounds like I fit pretty well in his shoes in law. I hardly ever come to you and speak well of you too long. This prophet prophesies, Ahab said, nothing good about you. He never does prophesy anything good about you. Some of these days, maybe I can come here and we'll just shout and pray people through, and I won't even have to fool you. But right now, let's obey the Lord. What do you say? Because I want to leave here in the will of God. And when Micaiah had finished prophesying, of course, against Ahab and against his going to battle, then Zedekiah, knowing he had Ahab on his side, walked up to Micaiah and said, and ask a question. I'm certain it was a sarcastic question. I'm sure he was not sincere. But really, it's an important question. Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me? Which way? And smote him on the cheek as he asked him the question. And Micaiah said, you'll understand you will see on that day when you enter into the chamber to hide yourself. The problem is, the fact is, the danger is that you sometimes have to wait till you go to the inner chamber before you answer this question. And that's what I don't want to happen to you. Let's answer it tonight. Before we're called into the inner chamber, you know, on another occasion, the scripture, the book of Jeremiah said Moab's going to get weary in the high places. See, there can be high places in your life. And he said Moab's going to go to the sanctuary to pray but he's not going to be able to prevail things will not always be the way they are tonight there could be a high place develop in your life before the dawning of another day you could be called to report into the inner chamber before the close of this night before the dawning of another day. Let's check it tonight. Let's be as honest as we possibly can. Would you forget that someone else in the church may need help? Would you forget that there are others that need it and just say, God, here I am. Save me. Deal with me, Lord. Do you know that I feel that way preaching this message to you? If God knows it, I ever told the truth in my life, I don't preach this to you, just to you. I'm searching. I want to be saved. You see, uh, then I would like, I don't have time to read all of these scriptures. I would just like to bring them to your mind. Most of them you're acquainted with. But the prophet said, be astonished. Of course, God speaking through him. Be astonished, O oh heavens. Now, mind you, this is serious. When you call for the heavens to become astonished. And be horribly afraid. What's the matter? What's so serious? What's taking place? My people, listen carefully, why heavens be afraid? Why be astonished? My people, first of all, have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and have hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns. That can hold no life. Praise God. Be afraid, astonished, O heavens. 
because of a certain condition that's developed in the, in the midst of God's people. The first thing, they have forsaken the fountain of living water. The next thing, they've hewn them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, with this in mind, let's ask the question again. Which way with the Spirit of the Lord from me? What leak hole did it lead from? What broken spot in the system did it go? What avenue? What channel? Through what uh, weakness of mine did I lose my contact? I wonder if I could ask you the question tonight and you would be honest, just as honest as you could possibly be. Would you answer yourself this question? Are you where you once was? Of course, the danger of being so sound asleep is that you could feel that you are. And there may be someone who is. Maybe you are. Maybe you have even moved up from where you were. But let's just be honest. Are you truthfully where you were? If your answer to that is no, I'm not. And I would believe with all my heart some of you would have to answer it that way if you were honest. Then let's check which way with the Spirit of the Lord from you. You don't bottle this up and put a lid on it and without any entertainment or effort or further digging or further praying or consecrating, keep it. Bye. This is not something you can. Hallelujah. This is not something you put in a jar and set on a shelf and have it next year without ever doing anything to it. In fact, friend, you can have it tonight and by Sunday night every bit of it be gone. Huh? You see, the most damnable doctrine that ever came to the world was once saved always. Oh, God. But do you know that it has, has a sly way of coming to our ranks? Oh, we'll quickly scream out, No, I don't believe that. But in actions, what do we believe? Right. Oh, God. If you don't believe in once saved always saved, and your answer to the question is, I'm not where I have been or where I should be, then what should be your reaction? Something should move you tonight to say, look, I can't depend on what I had back yonder. It's not a matter of can. I've got to have it tonight. Do you know the first chapter of the book of Acts in the 8th verse is translated like this? First of all, let me quote it like it is in the Bible. And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Did you know the original is written like this? You shall receive power while the Holy Ghost is on you. Hallelujah. I can use it either way. But let me use it, the original, for a while. Do you understand we are as lifeless and helpless as any Methodist, Baptist, Camelite, Catholic that ever was if we don't have Holy Ghost on us tonight? Amen. Right. Right. You can believe one God, oh, Jesus' God. name, and all of that when it runs out your ears. But we are lifeless, we are powerless, we are helpless. Unless that spirit comes on us tonight, I've got to have it tonight. Oh, the Holy Ghost is on you. Oh, the Holy Ghost is on you. Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me? What channel did it leak out? 
the broken cistern that's gone and forsaken the fountain of living waters. Hallelujah. Why is the cistern dry? Why is the bucket empty? Why do I find myself empty and void in a service to praise God? Why does uh, no longer the songs enthuse my heart? Why am I empty in my praying? Why am I empty when I start to study the Word of God or even to hear it preached? Why doesn't it excite me like it used to? Why the emptiness? Why the void vacuum that's formed there? Where did it go? Let's investigate and be honest with ourselves. What channel did it leak out? You see, if we could find the leak in the dikes, we could stop. We could stop a lot. A little story is told about the boy who found the leak in the dike and studied, stuck his finger in there and prevented a whole city until somebody could come and help. Stuck his finger in there and prevented a whole city from being washed away because the leak in the dike starts small. But the first thing you know, it's washing out more, 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 larger, larger. Bigger gusher of water is coming out. The next thing you know, the dikes are broken and the flood comes. And friend, that's exactly what can happen to you and to this church. The first thing you know, it starts with a little old small thing. The spirituality is not there. Oh, it's occasional blessing, occasional feeling of the presence of the Lord. I've felt it since I've been here. It's, uh, it's rather easy to get some of you to worship. But wait a minute. Let's go deeper than that. I have found a leak in the dice. And friend, I'm screaming for help right now. Do you know the danger of walking too far away from the Master? Do you understand that the steps downward are gradual? Do you know that Peter first simply walked too far from the Master? The next thing he walked, he stood by the wrong side. The next thing you know, he denies his law. Now wait a minute, that's not all. They come to him again and said, you are a part of this group. He goes and now then, it's not just a denial, it's a little more vehement denial. Do you know they came to him again? Uh, And this time, he's not just walking too far. He's not just warming by the wrong fire. He's not just saying, I don't know him. He's not just putting emphasis on it. I don't know him. This time he's blaspheming. Right. Step after step after step. Never happened to me, Brother Bean. You know that scares me so bad. Oh, God. It scares me so bad. I remember... My father-in-law came from California 2,000 miles one way to preach for my mother one night. It's a long ways to drive to preach one sermon. And I'll never forget as he read his text, I was thoroughly disappointed. Thoroughly. You know what his text was? I wanted him to get into something new and different and deep and all that stuff. But you know, friend, I just know and learn. That sometimes what we hunger for or want is not always what we need. Aye. 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 I just, he read his text and it was so disappointing to me at first, but then I recognized that God was really in it. I felt the anointing come. And this was his text. He that thinketh, he standeth. Take heed lest he fall. Well, I had observed a woman there in the church. She had, uh, one of, been one of the most faithful women I've ever seen in my life. You could not put your hand on her in any respect of holiness, faithfulness, dedication, prayer meetings, everything. Very regular to church. Live for God in a home where her husband was a pure devil. Why, her husband called my mother and actually threatened her life. He was a devil. And she lived for God right there with him. She stood against him. For the truth, she lived for God. But you know, can you imagine this? 
can you can this really dawn on you tonight? I remember just uh, not long before that I had inquired, asked the church to write out a list of things that they did in order as they did them, and bring them to church and read them. A very very strange request. Never done it before or since. But I felt it strong. Church, write it down. What you do each day in order as you do it, write it down and bring it to church and read it. Not that I wanted to know. I wasn't interested at all. I wanted them to know. This woman faithfully brought hers. As honest as she could be, she wrote it out. That I get up in the morning, get the children off the school, husband off to work, clean up the house, put out the washing, the ironing, go shopping, and she read it off. Each day she read it off. For three or four days she read, she read. And every day it was about the same thing, about the same thing. And she stopped after about 15 minutes of reading and broke down and began to weep. Mind you, a very faithful saint. She broke down and began to weep and said, and this covered a period of about four days. She said, and until this time, I had not knelt to pray. That was warning number one. Now the man of God drives 2,000 miles, 4,000 round trip to preach one little simple sermon that says, He that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. I looked at her that night, not particularly because that that uh, I feared she was going to fall because she had been very obedient. And uh, a few things that she was doing she had not done before. Uh, first of all, she had gone on a diet and uh, got the real slim. And folks began to brag on her figure. And naturally, she began to wear a little tight, too tight of dresses. And it got to be there's a little tighter and a little tighter. And first thing you know, uh, it was uh, to the danger point. And uh, because folks was bragging on her, and she, of course, enjoyed that. And but uh, it wasn't, the, you know, to the point that you thought, well, surely she'll correct it. And, but she began to weep in that message that night. Well, that's a good sign. If a church will respond, uh, some respond different. But she wept. She was moved by that message. That was on a Sunday night. Do you know, do you understand that two weeks later, that woman was a drunkard. That woman is a harlot. That woman drives the streets of Houston tonight to find any man that she can find on a street corner and pleads with him to get in her car, takes her, takes him to her house and says, I'll feed you, I'll furnish your bed, but stay with me tonight. She is the most weird thing I've ever heard of in my life. She calls all hours of the night, just different people, just to, with the weirdest sounds. And that I have seen her, God knows that I believe I know a saint. I don't believe you could fool me. And I'm not saying that to boast. But Brother Lawrence, I feel I have the Spirit of God. I've watched saints. I've found hypocrites. That woman had the dedication of the most faithful saint I've ever seen. I, I'll never forget her experience. She came in as a trinity. And the night she got the Holy Ghost, she spoke in tongues for at least two hours. And while she was speaking, I could at least understand a part of it. She spoke in the Spanish language. Over and over and over did she use the Spanish word for one. 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 One, one. God was drowning it in her right there. And no more than she had awakened from that. And quit speaking in tongues till she came and says, I want to be baptized in Jesus' name. And I've got the revelation of one God. What an experience. Oh. What a faithful saint. But the gradual steps of a dying. Oh I went four days and had not knelt to pray. Now her dress is too tight. And uh, two weeks after the war. Take heed, he that thinketh he stand, take heed, lest he fall. Two weeks later, she's a harlot. And do you want to know what I feel? I am the pastor of the church. 
I would not waste one split second in calling her to come. I would not give turn around to see her. Brother Bean, don't you care for souls? Certainly. I have dealt with them as bad or worse. But in her case, the Spirit tells me there's no hope. In fact, God spoke in our church the other morning a message in tongues and interpretation. And he said, there are those, some of those you're working on, that I have already turned away. I charge you to go to those that will accept it. And she's one of them. Forever lost. And you can't believe it, Harvey. When I think of her joy, her shout, her hope, her leading the song services, her, her blessedness in prayer meetings, and her faithfulness to ladies on theory and in ever respect. Friend, believe me, holiness, consecration, all of it, obedience, Humility, why if my mother ever went to her and found her in some area, do you know what she'd do? She'd weep and say, I'm sorry, Sister Bean, but I won't do it anymore. But Brother Lawrence, she's gone. My God, my God. She's gone. Which way went the Spirit? And do you know it didn't happen overnight? It started with her own confession. Do you know that's the reason God had me to have them write that on paper? That one woman needed to read and see how far God was down on her list. Children to school, husband to work, house cleaning up, washing, ironing, shopping. Next day, same thing. Do you see anything about that sinful? No. But you know what he did? It so occupied her, it so thoroughly occupied her mind. And I'll tell you what happened. She got to feeling like, well, you know, you get to live in the God and you get to feel like you don't really need to pray. You know you need to pray sometime, but not today. And then the next day you're busy and you think, well, I'll make it again today. And you'd be surprised how many people believe they can make it for a week or two. Right. And they can go on for a month. Oh, well, just so I go to church and go through the mechanics of Pentecost. Oh, and become an habitual Pentecostal. I'll be all right. But friend, you can no more live for God without praying and praying through. It's just as impossible as impossible to be. Amen. No more than you can live physically without ever eating again. Right. My God. Which way? Which way? A diet. A diet. Nothing wrong with going on a diet. It'd be a lot of folks better off if they went on a diet. But did you know a diet through her? Did you know going on a diet and folks started talking about how pretty her figure was? And brother, that drove home to her some carnal. There was a leak in the vessel. The cistern became broken. She suddenly began. Now where did this happen? This happened the day after day after day of forsaking the fountain of living water. Brother Lawrence, that couldn't have tempted her. If she would have kept praying through. She could have gone on that diet and had folks brag on her all day long. And it wouldn't have tempted her to get a tight dress. It wouldn't have tempted her at all. Amen. If she would have kept going to the fountain. Hallelujah. But she forsook the fountain. I hear the prophet cry and scream. He is screaming God's mind. He's giving God's attitude. He said, my people have forgotten me days without number. Oh, God. Can a maid remind you and say, well, 
One next to me? No more. Thanks for the milk. I'll guarantee you have a girl in this house. I don't care how long you've been married. You'll remember the dress she's married. Can that bride forget her attire? No. No, she remembers it. She remembers it. But my people, oh, they forgot that dress that was put on them the night they got a spouse to Jesus. They forgot that good hole in this humble spirit that they received the night they got the hand. They forgot that desire of prayer and how they loved one another and wasn't always picking off and wasn't always stirring up the strife and always finding something wrong. And Oh, no, not the night you got your attire. Friend, the night that I prayed through, there wasn't a hypocrite in the house. There might have been a dozen, but as far as I was concerned, every one of them was good. So that there wasn't a human being on top side of God's green earth that I hated or despised or didn't want to see. I loved everybody. I loved everybody. And listen to me, that's the attire that I got. When I became his oh, spouse, God, <laughs> friend, don't forget that attire. As you have received that, so long in him. Hallelujah. Am I quoting scripture? Amen. Aye. Amazing thing. We take for granted one another and take for granted a husband, take for granted the wife. Do you know the divorce courts are full today of cases where somebody took the other one for granted? You know that? Oh, when that courtship was going on, how careful everybody was. Lord, you're talking about being careful. Why, well, I've seen these little old girls. I remember my sister. She's always proud. And uh, she still don't have the Holy Ghost. And she would coax us. She would prepare us. She was just as country as we are and were. But somehow she had a streak of something else in her. And she would just be so embarrassed. She wanted things just right. When that feller came around, she wanted us to act right. And she would talk to us. And she would tell us how to act. And where to put them. Oh, how careful. How careful. What about yourself? Do you remember when you was courting? Did you just, it didn't make you any difference? Huh? Come on, be honest. Did it make a difference? Brother, you know it made a difference. Why, well, I knew one girl... Personally, in fact, she she came to the church in Houston several years ago. Literally fainted one day at the church from pure starvation, trying to keep herself trimmed to get her a boy. Fainted. But it's an amazing thing how they forget that after they get married. Oh, God. Isn't it a You know what happened? Taking one another for granted. Oh, how careful she was about that little hair. I've seen them that would look like, oh, just out of a band box. And after they get married, they don't care if they comb them. They don't care what the house looks like. Uh, no. <laughs> huh? You know what that will wind up? You start taking one another for granted. You just believe they're going to love you no matter how naughty you are. Come in, slop around, don't care, and don't ever tell them you love them. One fellow in, in California, Pentecostal man, he married, told his wife that night, this is the truth. This has actually happened. He told his wife, he says, look, I'm telling you tonight of our wedding that I love you, and I don't want to have to be a saying it all over again every few days. You know I do. This is it. This settles it. Now I love you. That's it. Somebody needs to talk to that man. Don't he have a licorice? 
Don't he know that that woman's going to have to be reassured about it? Come on. You can make a joke out of it if you want to, but the divorce courts are full of them tonight that made a joke out of it. Brother Lawrence, I've sat by the hour and listened to divorce case after divorce case and adultery case after adultery case of people who took the other one for granted. Now, here's what I want you to see. The Jews, you know, they got to the place they thought they had God hemmed in, fenced in, and he couldn't get out. They had the lively oracles, and they were Jews, and they had all that God ever had, and they had Abraham to their father, and they had the promise on them and all of that, and they thought nobody else can ever have God. We can have him at any price, yet we can have whatever else we want. We got him hemmed in and fenced in in the locked room. The Jews literally thought that. But one day they woke up. God reached out and got a prophet by the name of Hosea. And said, Hosea, go get you a woman of Jordan and marry her and bear children. And the first child was named the warning sign to Israel. Come on. You Jews think you got it made? I'm fixing to show you. I can get me another one. Where is the writing of your mother's divorcement is the question asked the Jews. And the answer is your sins have separated you from your God. Friend, that somebody took somebody for granted. They treated God like he was a dog. They didn't care what happened to God. His reputation, his truth, his precepts. They went a whoring after other gods, the Bible says. They cared not for the lively oracles. They handled God any way they wanted to. And thought any time I want to come back, I'd have him. But listen what he says. As he sits on the brow of the hill and looks at that bunch of Jews that night, he said, your house is left under you desolate. Right. And in the prophets he forewarned and he said, I will leave mine heritage and will forsake mine house. He's saying simply, Jews, I'm fixing to get up one of these nights. I'm going to slam that door. I'm going out the front gate and I'm going to leave you. You better start acting right. But the Jew never did it. Now then we that are grafted in contrary to nature, take heed lest he spare not us. That we just take it for granted that God's going to love us because we're one God, Jesus' name, and we maybe occasionally pay our tithes and come to church when we feel like it. My dear God, here we are. You bound to stay with me and don't feel you haven't prayed, haven't really sought your faith, haven't consecrated, but I know you're going to stay with me. Yes, that's about as reasonable as the young lady who fainted trying to keep her weight down and after she gets married just brother eat don't clean up nothing leave her like she is I got him yeah you haven't got him for long look here that night I knelt at that altar you talking about shrinking I shrimped that night and you did too or you didn't get no hold of that Right. You talked about acting right. You acted right. That oh, there I God. There wasn't a streak of hard headedness in you that night. Hallelujah. Brother, Hallelujah. you were the tenderest, most humble little old thing ever was. Thank you were courting the God in heaven. Hallelujah. You were trying to get his attention. My oh, God, I'm lost. I'm going to hell. I'm going to burn forever. Oh. Now, God, please help me and save me and give me the Holy Ghost. I'll do anything. I'll go anywhere. I'll do all God, just anything, oh, give me the Holy Ghost. You know you said it. Oh, and a God. Now, 15 oh, years man. later, five years later, oh, God. what's your attitude oh, toward God? God? Oh, God. Days without me. My God, my God. Oh, oh, Come into church just as careless and prayerless and. Oh, God. You know the spirit of this last age? Paul said in the last days they would be what? Unthankful. Did you know that's the spirit of this hour? Right. I have given my place, Brother Lawrence. 
I'd be as strong as a bull tonight, if you'll pardon the expression, if I hadn't given my strength to try to get Jesus' name, one God thing, to simply love the Lord. Oh, the God, spirit God. of the last God, age God. is unfaithful. Wow. Come in the church and take it for granted that God's going to accept my little old guy. Hallelujah. Oh. And my little old guy in and my mind somewhere else. Friend, you better hear me tonight. Oh. You better get up and pull your head. You better throw your shoes. Oh. You better go on and die. Hallelujah. You better get you some spiritual pills that will put you a little bit less weight. You better get a hold of you some Holy Ghost and, and start uh, dialing up a little bit to God. Yes, he don't have to have a living one of us. He's got some hot and pots in Africa that will love him. I stood with the people of Columbia, South America, and Brother Lawrence, don't ever, as you go down there, don't ever make the mistake of being, while you're preaching, to stop like we do sometimes. While we're going to another scripture or getting our breath or something, we'll say, let's raise our hands and praise the Lord. Please don't do that in South America. You know what happened? You suddenly lost that service. You don't ever regain it. When they, when you say raise your hands and praise God, they think you mean it. And brother, two hours later, they're standing there. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. All the American saints need to wake up. I'm not saying it's to hurt you. I'm not saying it's to just be critical. But there's a God tonight. Oh, we better wake up to the fact we've got a God in this thing. I sometimes think we worship the doctrine more than we do the God of this doctrine. And that's not an understatement. That's not a statement to say that I don't believe doctrine. But friend, there's a God in this thing. And do you understand that that God has got feelings? That that God is jealous. That that God is affectionate. And he demands the response of affection oh, from us. Hallelujah. Oh. oh. All right, old lady. All right, old lady. Let's keep talking about this. All right, old lady. Honey, would you mind jumping in the oh. Don't have a Forget it. Any tenderness? Well, that you tell us that these things have to be tender. Simple thing. It's not simple. <laughs> don't you mean to love your wife? Do you not love your sister? <laughs> Brother, that time Jesus Christ makes love to <laughs> you. You better believe that. He put for love stories to her. Thank God I happen to be a part of that bride. I've heard from oh, him myself. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, my God. Oh, I'm not here God. just to try to save a family. I'm trying to save my souls in the oh, place. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Of course, you didn't take it. You did it. Hallelujah. Once in a while, it wouldn't hurt you a bit in the world to get something you know she likes. You know, I found that. That's one of the funniest things. They can be, they can just be aggravating out doing, they just, they, sometimes they just imagine so much, and they just, uh, you know, I don't mean that I get mad at my wife, but you know, just women can be funny. <laughs> but on the other hand, dear Lord, <laughs> look at their value. You don't believe that? What have you got with one? Stay the around with it all these years. What are you doing? Why, you would go flat crazy if she wasn't that upset. I don't know what I'd do. I was a bachelor for years, but dear God, I would be lost as a goose to go back and be a bachelor tonight. And I found out those darling things don't have to have all that much, some of them. And they make no use for them to have to have that much for me, and that old girl just will make up her mind I'm not rich. But on the other hand, Brother Lawrence, a little small thing. I found out if it's got some tears in it. He didn't know that Jesus Christ is really not looking at all that much sacrifice out of him. 
God. Do you know what you're doing? You're telling Jesus Christ, you get over here in the corner, I haven't got time for you. Right. <coughs> Am I preaching the truth, Pastor? Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Which way? What channel? What, uh, what, what is the, the leak? causes it. How come I can get all fired up and then find myself again in the same state? You know, the search. There's a leak in the bucket. Leak. You, you, uh, you see, Every one of us has our weaknesses. Just well admit it, we got them. Sometimes we'd like to think we're exempt, but we're not. We've all got them. Your weakness may not be mine. But you know what we run into sometimes? Because your weakness is not mine, I'll criticize yours and forget mine. <laughs> That's why the Bible said to not be many masters, lest you have a greater condemnation. Brother, when I draw a line in a church and I demand certain things, I've got to search that thing out. Can I live up to that? Hallelujah. Or am I doing something even worse than that? You know, it's possible to drive people off for things that are a lot less important than what I'm doing. Go and learn what that means. Now, this same fellow, Ahab, he went on to battle. I want to continue with him. He went on to battle anyhow. Wouldn't hear the word of the Lord. That's dangerous. You better right. remember this saint. You don't get too old to hear the ministry warn you right. and instruct you. Right. You don't get so spiritual that you can tell the ministry what to do. Do you really understand that? If you don't, you're on your way now. Right. That is started already towards a reprobate mind. Right. Right. Well, the Lord's I knew a woman personally <laughs> that was so spiritual, she stayed in her house all the time praying. She wouldn't, oh well, she's faithful about ladies auxiliary. But uh, other things like personal work, anything else, that was so shallow to her. She spent her time praying. And you would think, here I am teaching you to pray, but I want to show you something else. Do you know some folks, the way they lose God is the lack of prayer. This woman had another weakness. She prayed all the time. But she had another weakness. Over, well, you can't say over spirituality because there's no such thing. Uh, so, I don't know what your name. But she was so, became so spiritual. Her problem, and she was in my mother's church. All hours of the night, she would get into some kind of a state. Oh, she'd go wild. And a good one. Just as good to my mother as anybody could be. But uh, you know what she was doing? She began to imagine that she was closer to God than anybody else. And she began to find things in the church. Well, listen, uh, do you know that's dangerous? Are you listening to me? And we're talking about which way went the Spirit of the Lord. Let's find out. See, I could preach on some of these more common things, and it may not touch you. But what I want to know, if I'm losing God, tell me how I'm losing God. Hallelujah. And brothers, she got to where 
that she got so spiritual, supposedly, that nobody could teach her anything. Oh, she found things. Oh, God, she'd find things all over the church. But uh, never see her sad. You could never get her to say that she's wrong. Her mother would jar her to her teeth rattling almost, and she'd still blame it on somebody else. Never could see. Self-justification of the first steps toward a reprobate mind. Right. You know what the woman wound up doing? She stood and publicly rebelled against my mother in front of the whole church. At one time loved my mother like it was her mother. She told my mother, said, you're like my own mother. Said, in fact, you're better because my mother didn't really care all. And wound up with a rebellious spirit. Now, where did she, where did that leak out at? Where's all this faithfulness going? What is happening? She got to where she imagined that she was so thoroughly above the average. Friend, self-righteousness is a dangerous thing. Hear me? Listening? Still hearing? All right. I don't want to ever get to the place that somebody can't tap me on the shoulder and say, Boy, that's, I'm afraid that's wrong. And me look at it and admit it's wrong if it's wrong. Oh, God. David said one time, he said, If my brother rebuke me, or if he slapped me, or if he smite me, said, I'll count it a joy. Hallelujah. I just figure he's trying to help me. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Oh, Listen, glory to you've God. got to have a tenderness and a humility, Hallelujah. preferring one another, honoring one another. Is that what the Bible said? Well, it's got extremely quiet, and maybe you're not understanding me. I don't know. Which way went the Spirit? Which way went? Where did, where did it go? Oh, God. The channels, the multitude of channels, I couldn't name them if I stood here till morning. The ways you can lose God. I could tell you some of mine. I could tell you where my weak points are. But that wouldn't help you. Why don't you just start looking for the leaks? Hallelujah. Now, look at here. We've got some folks that their temper is their problem. Can never attain spirituality because of a temper. They might gain it in one service, and the devil sees to it something happens contrary to their will and gets that all stirred up, and down they go again. Now this fellow Ahab went on to battle and disguised himself. Friend, you can't hide. <laughs> you may put your own a little disguise tonight and say, Boy, Brother Bean's not a shooting at me, and God's not a hitting at me. I'm all right. But friend, Ahab, this guy meant nothing. When God said through the prophet Micaiah that I saw Israel scattered as sheep not having a shepherd, don't you know that meant Ahab was fixing the gate? And Ahab had a little bit of fear of what that old prophet said, and he put him on a guard to disguise himself and went ahead in the battle. Headlong people. Oh, people that don't that more. People that won't be caught. Ahab wants to hear God. Right. See, I'm scared of my will. I was headed to, I was going to San Diego, California a little while back. My fellow evangelist. And I just, I really thought that was going to be felt good about it. And I headed out that way and I was going to stop by Fort Worth, Texas and preach to about a shoe up there for 92. And I got to Fort Worth and took six as I mean, Six, six. Just, just like that. 
Man, I thought I was going to die and hoped that I could. I was just sick to me. I had to go up there to die on me. Oh, no. That, that's all. In the midst of that sickness, during the night of rolling and tossing, <coughs> suffering, and promising, carrying on, brother, the son came through and said, this is for a reason. Yeah, but God has got old man will be there next Sunday night, and he, his church is going to die in me. And it looks like if he don't get help now, he be extremely sick. Yes, but you better hear me. And for a little while, I, I thought, God, just a minute now, so this is, what's the matter here? You better hear me. And Mother Lord, I could have, I'd rather somebody put me in the floor and beat me with a good, pretty long whip than to have to go call that dear man that was desperate and expected me to come and call him and tell him I was desperate. Well, our will's got to be before he can die. You know what? The boy spoke out to Saul of Tarsus. Said it's hard for you to kick against the prison, yeah. the gold. God's got gold, friend. Right. You know what that is? They have these sharp pointed sticks that they would use on the oxen. That gold in the lawn. Every time they got out of line, gold. Freaking. Speaking with that thing. God screams out at Saul of Tarsus and said, it's hard for you to kick against the bricks. God may be trying to slow you down. He may be trying to stop you. And I recognize that he was. I said, all right, God, I'll do anything you want. He said, go call that preacher and tell him you won't do that. Where are you going now? I don't know. I have no idea. I mean it. And they're laying up there sick, and I can't lay around on this man. Not a penny income coming in. What's going to happen? I don't know. But, operator, would you get me to San Diego, California, and have a day of grace? Brother Gray, this is Brother Bean. I'm awfully sorry to have to call you. But God has stopped me in Fort Worth. I can't come. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I, I apologize. But I'm scared to move because the Holy Ghost has stopped me. Well, do you know I have gone against that? <clears throat> I have. Got the beating of my life. Do you realize, friend, you've got to have a will that's easy? I think about the message I heard Brother O'Brien preach. And, uh, I don't know, he may have preached it here when he was here that time. But I think it's a marvelous thing. The significance of a glance. Do you know, the Bible said, the whip is for the fool's back, and the bridle and bits for the ass's mouth. And the Bible said, be not as the mule, which must be guided with bridle and bits. Always got to have bits. Do you know when Jesus Christ told Peter that he was going to deny him after the rooster crowed, what happened? Peter denied him. And even vehemently denied him. And even blasphemed in denying him. But you know what happened? Jesus said not a word but simply turned and looked at him. Right. Look at it in your Bible. He said, right. Jesus looked at you. And when Peter caught Jesus' eye, the Bible said he went out into the night and wept bitterly. Right. Wouldn't it be something if we could catch the significance of a glance? But do you know what some folks have got to have? Grab me a stick. I've got to beat another one. <clears throat> Saints, why should we wait till we're beat down? 
Why can't we be quick to understand God's trying to come back? Hallelujah. Do you know you're going to lose your spirit for us? This is where some folks lose out. On King's Ranch in Texas, do you know that one of our preachers visited that ranch, Brother Rodney Free, and he told me that he went there for the purpose to buy one of their cows. Horses. He thought maybe putting out such fine horses that surely some would not be what they came up to specification so he could buy them cheaper and still have a good horse. When he arrived, he tells them what he came for, the manager of the ranch. He said, Well, Reverend, I'm off the car. But he said, We don't have any so. He said, if a horse doesn't meet the specifications and the requirements, and we've got a set standard, said, we call it a soap factor. Well, he said, while I'm here, let's at least look around. He said, carry me to your, <coughs> carry me to your barn where your saddles and ride. <coughs> Got there, and there was roll after roll, saddles, riding. <coughs> Got to looking at him, he says, uh, well, uh, where's the bridles you use to break these rough horses? He said, this, this right here. Not one of them had a bit one of any kind. Just, just a hackamore type thing. He said, you mean you don't put bits in them? Why, he said, Reverend, if we had a horse that had to have bits, we'd call the soap factory in the morning. Said, if the horses on King's Ranch does not respond to the touch of leather against his neck, he's delivered to the soap factory. No wonder King's Ranch is so well known for its famous horses. <laughs> It's bred into it. One after another is bred from one that was taught and taught and taught until, brother, the touch of leather on his neck, he moves. Or the sway of a right rider in the saddle, he moves. And that be something? The Bible speaks of the wild ass. So he sniffs the wind to find water and food. And oh, he, I'm using my own language to describe what it meant. He detests the voice of the driver. He doesn't like hornets. But look at his old hip bones, too. Sniffing the wind to try to find something to eat. But the Bible talks about another kind of mule. Said he knows his master's crib. Hallelujah. Brother, he's got scars on his shoulder where through thick and thin, when the church is not doing good, still pulling. When things are dry and not moving, still pulling. That's Hallelujah. The sound of harness don't scare him. He just stands there and let the master put it on. Where are you going to plow today? Don't matter. I'm just a mule and I'm going to follow <laughs> the instructions of the driver. I don't make it. But that other wild ass, he hears horns. He's gone. But friend, look at the difference in the ribs. That one that's got scars on his shoulder, he knows that when the day's ended, there'll be corn in the creek. And he knows what stall to get in. You know that, fellas? Oh, that old you God. Learn that God. Stall. There may be a dozen stalls, but he knows his. Amen. Right. Come on, saints. Hallelujah. You're going to stay with God. You better learn to get in the harness. Thank because God. the people that like to stay in the harness, they'll always have something to eat. Hallelujah. That wild ass that never wants to be tamed, never wants to settle down, never wants to be governed. The Bible said some despise government. They don't like to just take the load of a church. They, they like the biggest thing of going. I actually run them off from the services where I was attending. I was in Fresno, California. House filled up. 
That's a figure of speech, really. I mean, they helped fill the house. Whole back end of the church was full of them. Heard about us talk, talking in tongues, then interpreting a little bit, praying for the sick, and they thought, boy, here's some excitement. They did that to everybody. Couldn't have got them to settle down in a church for nothing in the world. If a preacher would have said, look, you sit here and let me teach you some things. Nope, nope, I'm getting mine from the Lord. Do you know the ones Paul had more trouble with than any others? He said, some say I'm after Paul and some after this one and some after that. But he made one statement and said, some say I'm after Christ. That's the ones he had the most trouble with. I'd rather you be after Paul than have the attitude, I'm just after Christ and nobody can teach me. I'm a follower of the Spirit. Oh, God. oh, I'm so spiritual, I don't have to get instructions from anybody. I'm just a following Christ. Oh, God. I went out to the biggest tent that ever was made, supposed to be, the Reverend A. A. Allen's tent. One day, they wasn't having church, I wanted to see the biggest tent that was ever made. Well, there, I, there it was. I guess. That's what they said. And here was a woman, and she had her a bunch of colored folks around her and other people, and they were sitting there, and oh, she was the leader of the gang. And she stopped and talking tongues and jerk and shake and talking tongues and carry on. And, and I heard her say, Yeah, they wanted me to stop one of these UPC churches and settle down and become a saint. Ain't nobody going to get me to settle down. Woo, she come a shy, oh, she I, she I, and jerk and shake and carry on. And, Brother Bean, are you talking in tongues and making fun of making fun of her? Yeah. <laughs> she wasn't more talking in the Holy Ghost tongues than than a than a hound dog was. Hallelujah. Yeah. Can't get me to settle down. I'm a fallen Jesus. Fallen Jesus. Deceived. Right. Deceived. Right. The reprobate mind. Friend, you've got to be brought into subjection to something if you're saved. Come on, church. I'm still preaching on which way went the Spirit from me. I tell you, it can go through a delusion if you don't keep yourself in order. And there's nobody believes in spirituality anymore than I do. And you'll have to admit I believe it. I believe in shouting, I believe in talking in tongues, I believe in running eyes, I've marched them outside, I've interpreted, I've prophesied, I've done everything that God told me to do. But on the other hand, there comes a time when somebody's got to have somebody over them. And there's no gift, there's no operation of the Spirit, no manifestation, nothing, nothing. But what's subject to this pulpit at all times? If it's not that way, somebody's going to get off into a delusion. Right. Right. Well, I'd rather be the old mule who pays his tie and comes on, oh, old scars on him. Yeah, but things are not going right. I'm a kick in the traces. Uh-uh. This farm's a drying up. Just keep a pull in the plow. Farmer Jones knows. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All you do is pull the plow and eat when he puts you in the, in the crib. Put the corn in the crib. You just eat. Hallelujah. And you'll stay fat. That wild ass, he just hip bones. You can hang a hat on it. He can't find nothing to eat. He's a running wild. He don't know where he's going to eat tomorrow. Right. Glory. Hallelujah. Everybody say thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, I'm getting, I told you I was going to preach five of them tonight. I've only got to the first one yet and a part of the second one. Glory. Are you listening to me? Is it serious with you? Is it really serious with you? See, this is a day of deception, seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Seducing spirits. Beware of seducing spirits. Will you hear me, saints? Seducing spirits that almost seem like the Holy Ghost. Spirits that make you feel the same feeling the Holy Ghost feels, almost. Seducing spirits.
Well, deceitfulness of riches. Then the apostle came along with the same warning. He said, Beware, lest you be overcharged with what? Surfeiting, drunkenness, and cares of this life. And that day come on you unaware. That's what's got me scared tonight. Oh, God. Just drunk. Drunk on what? Just drunk. Just just things of this life. Quality, playfulness. Drunk. Just drunk. Some folks are money drunk. Money drunk. Yes, sir. Some are drunk on pleasures. Huh. Brother Lawrence, come help me. I got one that's drunk on horses and cars. All he's interested in is buying another car and another horse. Drunk on. Intoxicated. Yeah. Can't even pay his tithes because he's got to keep up this old horse or this old car. Drunk. Drunk. My God. Come on. He's drunk. Yeah. Right. Brother Lawrence, I've tried to reach him. He's drunk. He can't hear me. Drunk man, had, he, he's irresponsible. You don't understand. Drunk. Well, I wish I could pay my tithes. Quit feeding that old horse five gallons of feed every day. Sell that thing. Who needs a horse in Houston? Hallelujah. Come on, the horses love to have one myself, but dear God, if, if I'm going to let that keep me out of church and keep me from paying my tithes and walking with God, uh-uh. Amen. Nothing, there's nothing that'll move. Hallelujah. There's nothing hallelujah. movable or unmovable that'll make me do that. Oh, hallelujah. But you'd be surprised. Folks get drunk. Drunk. I've seen them drunk on education. Drunk on learning. I've seen them just staggering, staggering under the impact of just just gaining a few things in this life. Just drunk on reaching, grabbing. Oh, God. oh I had the sweetest couple that ever prayed through. Oh, you just couldn't imagine anything any sweeter than they were. Lord, Lord. I thought, in this precious? The little old boy's interested in church. He'd come to the front bench and Little, they put a little suit on him, and oh, he watched every move we made and was so serious. And they was doing so good, and you know what happened? After he got in the church and got to paying his tithes, and God got to blessing him, he increased in his salary, and he, he, he got drunk. He decided he wanted to brick home outside of town. More room for the children to play. Long ways, 20 miles. That's a long ways in Houston. That's like a hundred miles almost anywhere else. I don't know. No, brother, please don't do that. You won't come to church. Oh, yes, I will. Ever to pay much a little higher, but I'll be faithful. Oh, God. I am. They were doing so good, but they got wrong. That house. My God, that house. My God. That house. Oh. A brick house. A brick house. On the edge of an eternal hell, playing inside a brick house, admiring and absorbing the pleasure of a brick house on the edge of the cliff of eternity and hell. Explain. Oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> yeah, but I won't neglect church. It's a long ways. It takes extra gas to drive that much. What about it? No. Oh. Well, went on, pretty faithful for a while. First thing you know, ties is cut out. That's the first thing a back person starts to backslide. That's the first thing to chop off. That's the first signs of backslide. I've watched it for years. Right. It's the first signs. Oh, All right. Payment's too high. Gas has increased. Distance. Now then, it's...